good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Clive West Memorial Trust Annual Lecture. My name is Trevor Johnson, and I have the privilege of serving as chairman of the Trust. We're thrilled that you're able to tune in. We're sorry we're not in person, but I suppose this is just one of the other casualties of this present worldwide pandemic. We're thrilled that the Reverend Canon Von Roberts is our speaker this evening. We're privileged to have him. You will know him through his speaking. You'll know him through his writing. You'll know him through his leading. He is the rector of St. Ebb's Church in Oxford and has been associated with that church for close to three decades. We look forward to hearing from him. We also look forward to hearing from Bishop Andrew Foster, who is the Bishop of Derry and Rafu and has been for about six or seven months. He was a student in Theological College in Dublin and he did a placement with Clive West a long time ago, he will tell you himself. We're also thrilled to have two recent beneficiaries of the Trust give account of their time at Theological College and now in the early steps and early days of their ministry. We're thrilled also to have Romy and Ryan Scott who also are beneficiaries of the Trust. Romy is a doctor, a student doctor over in London and her husband Ryan is a theological college at Oak Hill Theological College and he is an ordinant in the Church of England. We're so thrilled to be able to support them and thrilled to have supported the other two that you will hear from. We're thrilled also to be able to say that this trust in very much its infancy, five years roughly, has been able to raise something like 50,000 pounds. That is thrilling for a very small trust in so few years. We're also thrilled to be able to say that over 500 people have attended the lectures, of course, when they've been in person in All Saints Church and University Street in Belfast. Our lectures have been watched and downloaded over three and a half thousand times the variety of lectures that we've had, and it has been quite a variety with well-known, world-renowned speakers and authorities on different aspects of Christian belief. The lectures have also been translated into Spanish and are being used by the Anglican Church in Chile to lecture some students as they train for ministry and other uh, Spanish speakers around the, uh, around the world as well. That was an entirely unintended thing from the trust. As we were conceiving of the trust, we didn't think that we would have that kind of partnership in the gospel around the world, but we're absolutely thrilled that that has been the case. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to hear more from the West Trust, please do check out the rest of the website. You'll see how you can contribute. You'll see how you can apply. You'll also see how you can find some of the other resources. And there's also a contact form in there as well. We would love to hear from you and we'd be so encouraged to hear from you, in fact. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to Bishop Andrew Forster. My name is Andrew Forster and I'm the Church of Ireland Bishop of Derry and Rafu. I'm delighted tonight to speak for a moment or two about the Clive West Trust and this evening's lecture given by Vaughan Roberts. It is hard to believe that it's nearly 30 years ago when I was a theological college student that I spent a placement uh, with Clive in All Saints. It was memorable and for me to be honest it was ministry enhancing and changed the way I viewed ministry those few weeks together. There was a number of things that stand out for me all those years later. Number one was Clive's commitment to biblical preaching. I remember sitting with him in his study in the old rectory and going through the passage that I was due to preach on the next Sunday. Clive taught me the best way for biblical exegesis and the best way of explaining what a passage meant to those who were listening and how in his memorable phrase that a sermon should be portable. In other words, people should be able to carry it home portable so that it would help them through the week that lay ahead, portable so that it would help them journey through life. The second thing that always stood out for me during that time with Clive in All Saints was his love for his parishioners. I remember vividly going to visit a house down in Donegal Pass and Clive and myself arriving in his car and we went in and we had a, a conversation that was full of fun and then in the most natural, sensitive and beautiful of ways, Clive was able to turn that conversation to the wonderful subject of salvation in Jesus Christ and explain to that dear family the truths of the gospel and God's love for them and his plan for their lives. It wasn't just a hello, how are you? It was a meeting of 
significance. It was a visit that pointed people to Jesus. The third thing that stands out for me during that time was the marriage of Clive and Margaret. Um, now, there were vegetarians, which maybe wasn't my cup of tea, but I loved times around their kitchen table with them, sharing with them. The fun was evident, the love was deep and real, and their sense of care for me and advice to me, because I was actually getting married that summer, was simply wonderful. And it stays with me, just that model of marriage in ministry together that Clive and Margaret lived out. And it was a, a real joy for me that Margaret then joined my parish in, in Dungannon. Now, unfortunately, I moved on quite quickly after that, but it was just lovely to have Margaret there and her prayer support and her love and her wisdom as well. The last thing that stands out for me from that time on, on my placement was prayer. Clive's life was surrounded by prayer. Every step of his day, it seemed to me, was blessed by prayer. That visit that I talked to about in Donegal Pass, as we pulled up in the car, Clive prayed. And when we left and got into the car, Clive prayed. His life was surrounded uh, with prayer. And I think that prayer, that commitment to God's word, that pastoral heart, and that strong marital home, for me, made Clive the influential man that he was and it remains in my life and in the lives of so many more. And the influential man that he uh, was in the life of the Church of Ireland and through the Clive West Trust keeps that legacy there. I know Clive would be just delighted tonight that, to know that Vaughan Roberts is lecturing. Um, I know that that would have been something that would have really blessed Clive to know that someone of the, the calibre of Vaughan as a biblical teacher, as a follower of Jesus, as a man of integrity, um, is, is sharing uh, in the Clive West Trust this evening. So I'm delighted to be able to be part of this special evening. And what I'd like to do now is pray. Let us pray. Father, on this evening as we share together uh, in fellowship as people who hold in our hearts a very special place for Clive West, we pray that as we celebrate his legacy of biblical preaching, of prayer, of pastoral care and of family love, we pray, Lord God, that his legacy would live in our hearts and in the love and then in the heart of the church that we love as well. Bless our time together virtually as it is and help us to understand something more of your grace, your mercy, your love and your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening everyone. My name is Peter Blair. I am the Curate Assistant at All Saints Church. And my name is Thomas Murray and I'm Curate Assistant at St. Elizabeth's Church in Dundonald. Fantastic. Uh, we were both uh, privileged to go and study at Moore Theological College uh, for four years between the years 2016 and 2019. Uh, we have been back in beautiful Northern Ireland for <laughs> almost a year to the day, really, uh, since we got back uh, in November last year. Uh, and we're here to talk a little bit about what our time at college was like, uh, why we went uh, to the other side of the world, uh, and to give you a bit of a flavour uh, of what the training uh, that we received through the Clive West Trust was like. Mm -hmm. So Thomas, before we think about college, could you tell us a little bit about how you ended up in full-time ministry? Yeah, good question. Um, so my background, um, I worked as a medical doctor. Um, I trained here in Queens and worked in the hospitals around the province. And over that time, I um, was still a Christian, um, but was very much convinced of the necessity of the gospel and actually sharing the gospel with people. And I always seen that as my primary goal. I was a Christian who was a doctor, not a doctor who was a Christian. Mm. But the more and more that I went through um, my training and work life, um, I was confronted more and more by death. Mm. And the reality was that as my hands were being tied from sharing, being free, and free to share the gospel with patients, mm. that um, I, was, I found myself reaching people too late with the gospel. 
And so there was a growing conviction um, within me of the necessity of, you know, why not me? Why not be trained up um, for the purposes of teaching and training other people in the gospel mm. and actually seeing people one for the gospel? Yeah. So that's what really led me to consider full-time gospel ministry mm -hmm. and being affirmed by a church doing a part-time uh, ministry apprenticeship in that um, also led to a church supporting me, um, like the Clive West Trust, um, to consider um, full-time gospel ministry and the opportunity in Sydney. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Pete, just to ask you on that, again, thinking about the urgency for ministry and thinking about, well, why, why college over in Sydney? Mm -hmm. Why not study here in Ireland? Why go over to Sydney and do that? Yeah, um, so we took four years out of our life uh, to go and be trained uh, for uh, for the for the next, Lord willing, 40 years of our life. Uh, it's a long time to take. It's an expensive decision. Mm. It's a painful decision to make, you know, leaving friends and family uh, for, for that extended period of time, even to go to a beautiful place uh, like Sydney uh, in Australia. Uh, my wife and I made the decision um, that if we were going to spend the rest of our lives serving God's people, uh, sharing the gospel with others, that it's really important to get the best training available. Mm. Uh, and we were convinced that Moore College was the place to get that training. And I'm really happy to say that after four years there, we remain very happy with that decision. Um, the, the, the level uh, of engagement with the Bible at college, the level of engagement in theology uh, and our Anglican tradition, mm. uh, all, all of those things have really given us a fantastic foundation mm. uh, for, for a lifetime of ministry. Uh, Moore College is, I think it's the largest Anglican seminary in the world. Mm. Uh, it, it, has a, it has a long, um, it's got a long history of training up gospel ministers. And seeing, going to Sydney and seeing the health of Sydney Diocese, churches growing, people becoming Christians, people uh, growing in their faith. Um, being there, it was really easy to see how the college fed the churches in yeah. that way. And seeing the health of Sydney um, is a real testament to the strength of the college. Hmm. Thomas, you were there uh, for the same four years that I was there. Do you want to tell us about some of the distinctives of college, uh, some yeah. of the things that you appreciated most about it? So some of the big things um, I loved about college, well, there's the college itself, there was the integration with churches, as you've said, um, but also the sense of community mm. that there was there in college. Um, learning in community together is a big thing the college encourages. Um, like the intensity of the course, is, it's right up there. It's um, a bachelor degree, but it's set at a master's level. And that intensity is to drive us as students mm -hmm. closer in our faith with God, to actually depend on him through the stresses and struggles, but also to depend on one another. And so feeling that sense of community and actually bringing us together um, reflects what I believe, you know, the New Testament does teach about the nature of the church. Mm. And seeing that modeled and practiced is really encouraging. But also seeing how the local church um, then is the focus and the focal point for the ministry of Moore College mm -hmm. um, as a ministry itself. And so every college student from the get-go, well, they're um, involved in student ministry. And what that looks like is, like for the likes of ourselves, you know, we were attached to two um, different congregations over our four years, two years, and two years. And in, during that time, you know, we were involved in one-to-one -one ministry, small group ministry, preaching, teaching, leading, and other ministries um, as they made themselves available in the church setting we were involved with. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, with other ministries we were doing in college itself. Mm -hmm. And um, part of that, yeah, it was beautiful to see that level of integration, seeing that coming together, seeing that work together, and actually having what we were learning in the classroom, mm -hmm. actually being brought into the fore, brought into the light as we set to put it into practice. Mm -hmm. And that was during our entire four years. So it wasn't just all theory, yeah. but lots of practice and lots of really jumping in the deep end with ministry. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. I remember once uh, sitting down with a couple uh, in my kitchen uh, in Sydney who were really, really struggling with their faith. They, they weren't sure uh, what they could believe. They weren't sure how they could know that anything was true, uh, never mind that the Bible was true. And I found myself regurgitating just what I'd learned in my philosophy class uh, two days previously. It was amazing. Uh, and it was just such an encouragement to see um, what we're learning in class, even though it's, it's difficult, uh, even though it was, it was stretching, really helps us uh, serve people to point people to Jesus. Mm. One of uh, my favorite things about college was how seriously they took the idea that a husband and wife together in ministry are not two separate entities, but they're a team mm. uh, serving the church together. Um, my wife, Jody, uh, for four years was given excellent, amazing training uh, in how to handle the Bible for herself and how to support me in my ministry and how to serve uh, all of the women 
uh, in our church. Uh, the training that she received uh, as a minister's wife, uh, I think, is, is second to none. Uh, and now, uh, in ministry, in our first year of curacy, uh, I'm seeing her grow and flourish in her ministry. And she's going back to the notes that she made. Mm. Um, and she's saying, oh, we talked about this at Moor Women. This, this happens all the time. Uh, it's been such, such an encouragement. Now, Thomas, you went out to Sydney uh, without a wife. You came back to Sydney with a theology degree and... And a wife and a son. Fantastic. Yes, Sam, um, I brought a little bit of Sydney back with me, um, to say the least. Um, yeah, so I went out as a single guy. I'm not saying this is going to be the case for every single guy that leaves Ireland's shores to train in college. An important disclaimer. An important disclaimer. Yeah. But um, I went over there, um, single guy, and we got and I met Jody in my first year. We got married in our third year and um, had Theo in our fourth year. So managed to squeeze a lot of life um, into four years of Sydney. Um, but even even with that, you know, it's been really encouraging. You know, Jody and I have been back now. Um, sorry, my wife Jody as well <laughs> um, has been back now. Um, for a year, um, serving at uh, St. Elizabeth's and Dundonald. And you know, no doubt this year has been faced with many challenges. Mm. But part of the beauty, beauty of Moor College is that I do feel very equipped mm -hmm. um, to deal with lots of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So rather than just focusing on lots of um, practicalities, although the practicalities are there, mm -hmm. um, Training at Moor has really equipped me with, you know, strong theological principles, mm -hmm. how to read the Bible well, mm. and how to teach and train others to do that. Mm. And having those principles in place yeah. is actually what informs how I can live and react and, you know, um, se seek to minister to people mm. um, amidst all these COVID times. Yeah. So that's been, that's been a really big encouragement for mm. this first year post-ministry. It's been challenging mm. in lots of ways, mm. but been greatly encouraging to see what I have learned yeah. um, be put into practice here. Yeah. I'm just so grateful uh, for the four years uh, that I got to spend at Moor College. I'm so grateful to be back and serving God's people here in Ireland. And I'm so grateful for the Clive West Trust, uh, for the financial support uh, that they gave us, for the prayerful support that they gave us, for the, the personal support that they gave us, you know, keeping in touch, seeing how things were. Um, I'm just so, so grateful. Uh, and we, we just, we genuinely could not have done it Definitely. without the Clive West Trust. Yeah, I just want to echo there exactly what Peter has just said and only to add that, yes, please um, don't think that your money doesn't make a difference. It makes a huge mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. Um, there's a great relief on every ministry student whenever they do see money coming into the bank account. And it just gives a great sense of freedom and really lifts a burden mm. um, financially and just to know that we are being freed up we are being supported and being encouraged um, to train and then to be redeployed and yeah. to be sent out and to serve God and his gospel especially here in our wee country our wee country fantastic uh, we're so glad uh, to be able to join you, uh, even in this digital way. Uh, we're really looking forward to next year, Lord willing, to be able to meet together in person. Um, but it's great that we are able to do this uh, in this sort of digital format. Uh, so I'm going to hand over now to um, whoever is up next in the program. Thanks very much. Bye. See ya. Well, good evening, everyone. It's really good that you're able to join us. Um, and we're delighted that Vaughan Roberts has agreed to do our lecture. And we're going to take a moment now to interview Vaughan. Vaughan, you'll be known to some who are watching. Um, you'll be known to others through your writings. Uh, tell us a, a bit about yourself, Vaughan, and how you became a Christian. It's so good to be here, by the way, Trevor. Good to, good to talk. I'd love to be actually physically present, obviously. Um, I grew up in a church going home and uh, went to school where there was chapel, actually a, a huge amount of church and religion, but I was completely turned off by it. And it was only in my late teens, my elder sister became a Christian at university and she became one of those irritating family members that just went on about it. And uh, I got annoyed, but various things prompted me to think, actually I need to think about Jesus. So I didn't tell her about it, but I began to read in um, my case, Matthew's gospel. I just knew that the Gospels about Jesus and it was through reading Matthew that I became convinced that Jesus was real and my life was turned around so if you'd told me at 17 I'd end up being a clergyman it would have been unthinkable but uh, a year later I couldn't imagine doing anything else yeah and you've been in ministry you became a Christian obviously when you became a Christian you've been in ministry but full-time financially dependent ministry for quite a while now you were um, a curate in the church of which you're now rector. You also spent some time in South Africa. Um, tell us about the ministry you're doing now and the ministries that you've been involved in. Yes, I've been uh, here at St. Ebbs in Oxford for over 30 years. First as a church member, 
for two years while I trained for ministry and then for nearly 30 years in in various roles for the last over 20 years I've been a rector and overseeing the whole thing but before that I did student and youth ministry for a number of years but uh, I mean it doesn't matter what particular sphere I'm in I, I take it all our roles are very similar in, in that we're called to a ministry of word and prayer and uh, so preaching and teaching and, and do the work of, of an evangelist these are right at the heart of what I'm trying to do and as a team leader we've got quite a big church trying to encourage and equip us at the same You've also been involved in uh, the 938 web, um, growing new ministers. And obviously our trust is concerned with that. The West Trust is concerned with that, growing new ministers. Tell us a bit about your involvement with 938 and the apprenticeship scheme in St. Ebbs. I'm sure it's been a, a real encouragement over these years. <clears throat> yes, for, for those who are wondering what, why 938, the, um, the title for that, I, I started with, with Richard Cokin and Ian Garrett, three three of us um oh i forget 25 years ago or so now and we picked the name from matthew 938 which has been described as the other lord's prayer um we, we frequently pray our father who art in heaven but uh, the lord jesus encouraged his disciples to pray another prayer ask the lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest field but how often do we pray that other lord's prayer and the aim of 938 was in, to encourage people to be praying that and to encourage ministers particularly and church members to be thinking one of our responsibilities is to be looking for the next generation and to put before them a vision for full-time set apart word ministry and then seeking to discern um, with the lord's help who might be suitable for that and beginning to train them and so apprenticeships is very much part of that vision and we've had uh, i mean loads and loads at st Ebbs over the years and it's been hugely encouraging Many have gone into Christian ministry as a result, but actually that's not the goal. Sometimes it's, um, it's worked really well when someone's put a toe in the water and thought, actually, this isn't quite what I'm suited for. And much better to discover that early on than to go down the road of training and end up in ministry and think, I'm, I'm just not quite suited for this. So it's very much part of a discernment process, the apprenticeship, um, but it's, it's been a great joy and encouragement to be involved in training many apprentices over many years. Um, the uh, lecture tonight um, that you're going to be giving, uh, there are two presuppositions within the lecture that, that, that the world is broken and that the church to some degree is broken. Um, I don't know what you're going to say in the lecture. I assume uh, you agree with some of that title, that the world is broken and the church is broken. And the assumption is a, a church that's broken cannot help a broken world. So what, what, in brief. What do you think? Well, I, I certainly do agree. Um, sadly, we're in a fallen world and the, the world is obviously broken and the fall affects all people, including Christian people and even redeemed Christian people. Of course, we continue to be broken and um, that's reflected in uh, the divisions we find in the church. And of course, there are different reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is because even within the external church there are those who don't believe the gospel of our lord jesus and have turned away from it and there's a fundamental breach at that level and that's uh, that's terrible you, we, we can't reach the world if we turned away from the gospel but there are also the very very sad divisions between converted people and um you know that's that's a a great sadness and actually can cause more hurt and uh, we can harm each other more amongst converted people sometimes and uh, friendly fire is responsible for a huge amount of damage in the church and certainly i want to reflect on some of these things in the lecture well Vaughan, we're absolutely thrilled um this is the clive west memorial trust lecture and you knew clive um you know margaret um just briefly a thought on clive margaret and the west they're they're relationship with you i i know um clive visited you and you visited all saints back in the day i remember when i was a, a young student worker and you were a really young student worker meeting you in belfast for the first time uh, <laughs> we've both aged really well um uh, you must have some memories any anything at all that um springs oh, i certainly do and i remember that uh, trevor uh, when yes you, i think you might have had some hair then as i recall it's going back a long old time and uh, yeah, um, many memories of, of Clive and 
yes, um, of Clive and Margaret. And um, oh, what a what a lovely man! Uh, uh, Clive managed to to combine within himself um, huge graciousness and uh, just a, a wonderful warm heart, and yet absolutely rock solid Bible convictions and prepared to stand up for them and to fight for them. So he, he was very tough, but very gracious. And I think uh, he was a wonderful model for us in how to engage in some of the challenges, not least in a mixed denomination like we have within the, the Church of Ireland, Church of England. And um, just a gentle man committed to grace and truth. And it, it's lovely to think of Margaret listening. I'd love to have caught up with Margaret, but uh, a great model too. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for giving the time. You're a busy, busy man. We are also sorry that you can't be with us. We'd love to have um, had you over here. Um, and uh, even the, the lack of interaction in this evening's lecture, that's, a, that's another casualty of all these things. Um, but Vaughan, thank you very much. And uh, we're praying for you as you lead in St. Debs and, and across a, a wider field of evangelicalism. And thank you so much for uh, what you're about to say. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ryan Scott and my name is Romy Scott. It, we're so glad to be able to join you tonight. Hello to everyone watching. We currently live in England in Oak Hill Theological College where Ryan is a second year student and I work as a junior doctor in a hospital in Essex. We're really uh, thankful really for the support that we get from the Clive West Memorial Trust uh, that allows us to be here at college. Uh, we've learned so much really over the last year uh, and it's incredible really whenever I look back just how much even academically I've learnt uh, and spiritually and um, the way the things that God has been teaching me as well. Most recently uh, one of the things I've been struck by is just the way God's been equipping me and preparing me for ministry really in the long uh, the long haul and um, so whenever I'm going into lectures whenever I'm thinking about pastoral ministry or the biblical languages or ethical issues or whatever the question is uh, God's just been helping me think what is this what will this look like in five years' time, in ten years' time, in thirty years' time? Um, and so please do be praying for me that uh, that, that understanding, that uh, equipping would continue uh, with me every day as I'm in lectures. Yeah, and I've had the privilege to join a fellowship group for the spouses at college. And I have been really struck by this last year, especially in light of how 2020 has gone, is that the hope that we have um, that's given by our Sovereign Lord um, is completely different to any hope you can find in the world. Um, so that's been a great reminder this year. Mm. Um, things that I would love prayer for is um, I'm considering what to do next year. So um, prayers that I would be able to find a job that I could ideally do part time, um, which would allow me to um, get more stuck into a college life and perhaps do a few modules myself. Mm. I'd really appreciate prayer for that. And for myself, uh, please be praying uh, that God's Spirit would be at work within me um, so that everything I learn would turn into praise um, for Christ uh, as I learn more about him. Please also be praying for my uh, just my daily routines and daily rhythms of life. There are a few sort of uh, areas of prayer that I'd like to work on um, that will just help equip me to live for God um, really every day. So please do be praying for me uh, in those ways. Um, our readings for today are taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 11 to verse 18, and then from chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 6. So, Ephesians chapter 2, starting from verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, 
thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I was about to say how good it is to be with you, but of course uh, I'm not with you. There's a sense in which you're with me here in uh, St. Ebbs Church, right in the centre of Oxford. So welcome to St. Ebbs. I'd much prefer to be with you. And uh, we're back to this strange experience uh, of preaching to an empty building and to a camera. Preachers amongst us will know how difficult that is. But we're getting used to it. And as I see the camera, I'm trying to imagine old friends in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, I th I'm so grateful for friendship and fellowship. And um, I praise God for the unity that we have in Christ, which is very much our theme today. Let me pray, and then I'll go to my lecture. Loving Father, indeed we do praise you for our unity in Christ. And we pray, please may what's about to be said not be my words and my wisdom, which is just not worth hearing, but may we together hear your word and be shaped by it as we think about this important theme. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Well, let me pick up on some words that have just been read to us, I think, from Ephesians, those great words of Ephesians 2, verses 13 and 14, where Paul says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Down the ages, walls, of course, have been potent symbols of the division of human beings. We think of the Berlin Wall, which stood for 40 years, dividing the East and West in Europe. Here in Oxford, we had the Cutslow Wall, it's astonishingly built between a council estate and some pre-existing private homes because the private homeowners didn't like the thought of the council house dwellers going through their homes and, the, and their rather posh roads to the schools and, work, and jobs where the council house owners uh, or dwellers worked. And so a wall was put up, forcing those in the council estate to go for a mile-long detour around it, a wall of division. In Northern Ireland, of course, you're familiar with the peace line separating loyalist and nationalist communities. In recent years, we praise God that the Berlin Wall came crashing down in 1989. The Cutslow Wall was felled in 1959 with a cheering crowd enjoying what was being done. The peace line largely still stands, but praise God for progress in Northern Ireland, although tensions, of course, as you're well aware, remain. But real progress since the, the, the terrible days of the Troubles. But the sad reality is, where certain divisions might reduce in the world, others increase. Where some walls come down, others are built up again. This is the reality in a fallen world. And Christians, although saddened by this, are certainly not surprised. We know our Bibles. And we know that the first sin, Genesis chapter 3, led to the first murder, Genesis chapter 4. As people turn away from God and are in conflict with God, we end up in conflict with one another. We're not surprised, but nor do we despair, because we're conscious of another great reality. Terrible divisions in the world, and yet a glorious unity in Christ. Since before the creation of the world, God had 
an amazing plan. Ephesians chapter 1 speaks of this eternal plan of God, chapter 1 verse 10, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. It is an amazingly big gospel, isn't it? It's not just about my soul being put in connection with God. It's about souls, bodies, communities, the whole of creation. The fall led to a fracturing, yes, within the human person, between humans, above all between human beings and God, and division and disintegration in the whole created order. And God's plan, which he had in mind before the creation of the world, that blows my mind, is to reintegrate everything and bring unity to all things under Christ. And that plan of God is not a distant dream. It's already been activated. Christ came on a mission of love to break down the barrier that cut us off from his heavenly Father, that barrier between human beings and God. The moment he died, of course, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple, symbolizing the division between a holy God and sinful people was torn in two from top to bottom. And we've already read Ephesians 2 verse 13. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The dividing wall between sinners and God broken down in Christ. And more than that, within God's family, the dividing walls that used to separate us are now broken down so that the divided are brought together and made one in Christ. Ephesians 2, 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Speaking, of course, in that context, of the great division of the ancient world, that between Jews and Gentiles, the two wonderfully becoming one, the dividing wall of hostility broken down. So Christian unity is not something first and foremost that we must strive to create. It's already been achieved. It is a fact in Christ. And as the gospel goes out around the world, and by the Holy Spirit, people's eyes are opened and they are connected with the Lord Jesus Christ through faith in this gospel and faith in him. The result is a wonderful union, union with God, no longer division, and in Christ, a wonderful union with one another. And that is true in heaven, Paul says in Ephesians 2. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. That's where we belong, with the invisible church consisting of all believers from all time, down the ages, people of every tribe and nation, people and language, one in Christ. And there are visible manifestations of that invisible church in local churches around the world. And each local church gathered together by God's grace through the gospel by the Spirit is, as F.F. F. Bruce has put it, a pilot scheme. He says local churches are God's pilot scheme for the reconciled future of the universe. He goes on, the uniting of Jews and Gentiles was God's masterpiece of reconciliation and gave promise of a time when not Jews and Gentiles only, but all mutually hostile elements in creation would be united in that same Christ. God's pilot scheme pointing to that glorious future. I was once at a, a gathering of um, church leaders, and Rowan Williams was the Archbishop of Canterbury at the moment, at the time rather, and he said people should be able to look at the church and say, I've seen the future and it works, and the person uh, next to me under her breath whispered, actually more often they say, I've seen the past and it doesn't work. Well, sadly, that's the truth. So often we look as if we're outdated and we're not really getting on very well. But Rowan Williams was right. People should be looking at the church and saying, I've seen the future and it works. God's pilot scheme. And we've seen glimpses of that, haven't we? We're going to be talking about Christian divisions, certainly, this evening. But let's delight in the reality that 
There is a genuine, deep Christian unity that is manifest in relationships with fellow Christians, above all in local churches and gatherings of believers. I was converted in my late teens, and I went to the little Christian union at school, my last year at school, and I saw in that group of Christians a unity that I hadn't seen anywhere else in the school community. School community divided between the kind of cool kids and the, and, and the uncool, between the sporty lot and the unsporty, the very bright ones and the less bright, different cliques and divisions, and yet I found in that Christian union representatives of all those different groups and the different years, they were very stratified. Senior boys in the school, not really mixing with the others. And here was a wonderful unity. And I've seen it many times in my life. I see it here at St. Ebb's Church. We're very flawed. But I think of um, a wonderful time on our student weekend not long ago where a rugby blue, very, very good rugby player, one of the, the sort of gods of the university community, speaking with a very shy kid in their first year certainly not sporty at all, and really getting on well, a lovely unity. I've seen on one of our church weekends a head teacher from a really smart school having a long conversation with a former big, big issue salesman converted to Christ, formerly sleeping rough. Yes, we've seen it. Two realities in the world, and yet, and yet, and yet, although we've seen it, sadly Christians exhibit too often the divisions of this present world rather than pointing to the unity of the world to come. We can end up not being a magnet but repelling people. Paul's not naive about that. And so while proclaiming the, the great reality that we are one in Christ, he acknowledges that often the reality is not worked out in practice and there are great divisions amongst us. And thus his appeal Chapter 4, verse 3 of Ephesians. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Keep it, notice. We're already one in Christ, but make every effort to keep it. Well, for the rest of my time, I want to think about what that might look like in practice. What does true unity require? And we're going to pick on four themes from Scripture just briefly. Theme number one, what does it look like? upholding truth upholding truth it's through the truth of the gospel that true unity with christ true unity with one another is established by the holy spirit ephesians 1 13 you were included in christ when you heard the message of the truth the gospel of your salvation that's how we became one in Christ and one with one another. We heard the gospel of the truth and the Holy Spirit opened our, our eyes and, and moved us to respond with faith. And then that unity with God in Christ and with one another began. And so any true Christian unity must be founded on the apostolic gospel. That was sometimes forgotten in the uh, era of the ecumenical movement. Of course, it hasn't come to an end, but uh, it was very much a focus in much of the 20th century. And there was a right concern at its heart. It emerged, the modern ecumenical movement, at the Edinburgh Missionary Conference of 1910, where representatives of mission agencies from around the world gathered with the noble aim of the evangelization of our world in this generation. It's a great goal. And they recognized that that goal was undermined massively by unnecessary divisions. And so they resolved to try to work as much as they could towards visible unity. A good and right goal. But sadly, in the days that uh, followed, too often, a concern for unity led to a marginalization of truth. Ecumenism led to ecumania. Or in the phrase I think of Jim Packer, it became the uncontrollable urge to merge, a kind of lowest common denominator approach with a mantra, love unites, doctrine divides. Let's not talk about troublesome doctrine. This kind of spirit was caricatured in a brilliant essay by uh, Monsignor 
Ronald Knox, who was Roman Catholic chaplain to Oxford University, just down the road here, actually, but the son of an evangelical Anglican bishop of Manchester, actually the grandson of a former rector of St. Ebbs, a memorial window to um, Ronald Knox's grandfather, is behind me, first bishop of Lahore, Thomas Valpy French, and then a rector of St. Ebbs at some point as well. He wrote a brilliant um, satire, it's in this book, Essays in Satire, which he called Reunion All Round. Let me give you a flavour. Knox imagines one united church in England that will include all professing Christians, whatever they believe. He says, in this new church, nobody will be expected to recite the whole creed, but only such clauses as he finds relish in. It being anticipated that with good fortune, a large congregation will usually manage in this way to recite the whole formula between them. So that would deal with um, little differences in doctrine amongst Christians. And then he suggests in this uh, essay, let, let's extend it to people of all faiths. Let's recognize, yes, uh, there are some superficial differences of doctrine, like the divinity of Christ. But he says, is this difficulty final? Again, get the humor here, but it's a little bit too close to home. Let five Christian and five Mahometan theologians be closeted together for a week to discover these controverted doctrines. The Christians explaining to their less enlightened co-assessors what sense such doctrines are really meant to convey. And I, for one, shall be vastly surprised if at the end of the week the Muslims are not prepared to accept the Athanasian Creed in the same sense in which it is maintained by some of the most highly placed ecclesiastics of our country. And then, having dealt with the difficulties between people believing in God in different ways and different faiths, he moves on to the problem of incorporating atheists, which he suggests is easily solved. Already, he says, we say that, both, that God is both imminent and transcendent. Well, can't we just extend that to one final antinomy and suggest that God is both existent and non-existent? We shall be able, he said, to recognize the divine governor of the universe as one who exists and yet does not exist, causes sin yet hates it, hates it yet does not punish it. Within a century at most, this is Knox writing in 1928, by the way, within a century at most, we shall make the Church of England true to her Catholic vocation, which is plainly to include within her borders every shade of belief. <laughs> Well, it is a caricature, but there's enough truth in it to be uncomfortable, is there not? Because we've seen too much of that kind of thing, which Knox, of course, takes to extremes, but too much of that kind of thing. Undermining truth for the sake of unity. That is not what the Bible envisages. One of the great texts of the ecumenical movement is uh, John's high. Jesus' high priestly prayer in John's Gospel, John 17, which is a very important text. It's very striking. It shows how passionate the Lord Jesus was for unity. Here he is about to be arrested, knowing he's about to give up his life and be crucified. And what's on his mind and in his prayers and on his heart? A longing for the unity of his people, both in that generation and in the generations beyond. And it's striking how his people are described. John 17, 20. My prayer is not for them alone, talking about uh, the apostles. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's who Christians are, those who believe the apostolic gospel. And then he continues, verse 21. Here's my prayer, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. William Temple's striking words, the way to the union of Christendom does not lie through committee rooms. It lies through personal union with the Lord, so deep and real as to be comparable with his union to the Father. And that union, of course, is brought about by the Spirit through the truth, the apostolic gospel. 
This was a key issue at the time of the Reformation. The debate was, what is an authentic church? Roman Catholics were saying that the Roman Catholic Church was saying about bodies like the Church of England, you're not a true church because you're not connected with the Pope, you're not connected with Rome. And the reformers responded in saying, no, the key issue is whether you believe the gospel. They highlighted the centrality, not of Rome and of the Pope, but of the gospel, Article 19 of the Church of England. The visible, visible Church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men in which the pure word of God is preached. Kind of a church without the gospel, because it's through the gospel that the church is created as people are born again through faith in Jesus Christ as they hear the gospel. So true unity requires upholding truth, and it's important to recognize, those of us who are Anglicans, that this reality is in our very DNA. It's, it's there in our history. The truth must ultimately trump the institution. And that was what was going on as the Church of England ended up um, being distinct from the Church of Rome. True unity requires upholding truth. Let's move second to opposing error. Opposing error. Yes, unity is very important, but not at any cost. When professing Christians depart from the apostolic faith, they're not to be accommodated in a kind of Noxian way in that uh, caricature, but resisted. Of course, that begs a big question. If unity requires a union in the apostolic faith by which that unity comes into being in the first place, what is included in that apostolic faith over which we can't agree to differ because it's the foundation of our unity? We'll see in the, the next point we're coming on to that there are some differences that shouldn't lead to division. So how do we decide where the line is drawn and where is the area in which we simply cannot agree to disagree. Well, we need to look to Scripture. In the Bible, on a number of occasions, it's clear that certain doctrines are seen as especially important. Think of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15. What I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for sins, according to the Scriptures, and so it goes on. Or well, those lovely gospel summaries in Titus 1 and Titus 2. In the second of them, Paul says, Titus 3 verse 8, I want you to stress these things, which are the little gospel summary of verses 4 to 7 of chapter 3, taking us right to the heart of the gospel. These are what Kevin Van Hooser calls level one doctrines. You can see that distinction even within Scripture. Level one doctrines... I quote Van Hooser, what every follower of Jesus anywhere and at all times must believe, both to preserve the intelligibility of the gospel and the fellowship of the saints. John Calvin says something very similar. Here's Calvin. Not all the articles of true doctrines are of the same sort. Some are so necessary to know that they should be certain and unquestioned by all men as the proper principles of religion. So how do we know what is absolutely at the heart of this apostolic faith, where we can't agree to differ at all? Well, Scripture gives us clues, and we've got the resources of Christian tradition to rely on as well. And tr tradition matters. We're not the first to be reading the Bible in our generation. There are generations of faithful Christians who read it before us. And so we stand on the shoulders of those former generations as we come to the Scriptures. And the teaching of the faithful church is often clarified over the years as a result of controversy. We see that with the, the Christological controversies of the early church, leading to the great creedal statements that uh, clarify what the Bible teaches about the person and work of Christ, for instance. Again, speaking as, Angli as an Anglican, the Anglican reformers followed the lead of the church fathers on those fundamental matters. So the 39 articles of religion, 
begin by affirming the Nicene, the Apostles, and the Athanasian creeds. And then the articles make clear that there's a commitment to the teaching of justification by faith alone as another core doctrine which takes us to the heart of the gospel, which is a salvation issue. There can be no agreement to differ on those matters. Those who teach contrary to those central apostolic truths should not be accommodated. The Bible says again and again they need to be resisted. And there are all sorts of examples of that kind of resistance in the New Testament, which are important models for us today. Examples, for instance, of confrontation. Galatians, here are some new teachers have come in. And they are undermining the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And Paul never cursed to Paul to say, well, we can just agree to disagree on, on, on this one. On certain matters, very strong on that. Don't fall out over secondary, unnecessary in, things indifferent. But when it comes to justification by faith, no, he, he confronts, he confronts the church. You foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? He confronted Peter. I posed him face to face, he said. Confrontation. Example of discipline. Titus chapter 1 gives various qualifications for those who are to be appointed as elders. And Titus 1 9, we're told that the elder must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. It's striking there that pastors have both a positive and a negative role. We're, we're to encourage through the, the scriptures, but also to um, refute false teaching. Both are very important, the negative as well as the positive. Chapter to 1, verse 11 of, of Titus, false teachers must be silenced, which I take it means they're not to be given a platform. If necessary, action should be taken to stop them promoting error in the name of Christ's church so that the people of God are not confused and, and led astray by teaching that causes them spiritual harm. So there's a discipline that's modeled in the New Testament. Confrontation and discipline and also separation. Romans 16 verse 17, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, separate. Now, of course, there are different ways of understanding what that might mean in practice, but the principle is here. Keep away from them. 2 John 7 and 7 to 11, John warns Christians not to welcome any who deny the true gospel about the incarnate Christ into their house. And I take it the principle there is don't provide them with practical and financial support that enables them to continue to proclaim their errors. True unity requires upholding the truth and opposing error. But also, in the right circumstances, it requires, third, embracing tolerance. Embracing tolerance. Some truths are foundational. There can be no agreement to disagree um, uh, on that one. But they're fundamental. Teaching which undermines or counters those core truths endangers salvation, that should be opposed. But what about those areas of belief and practice in which Christians may differ, but actually they're not about these core fundamental doctrines that are right at the heart of the faith, that are matters of salvation. Sometimes they're called adiaphora. Actually, that term isn't used in the New Testament. But in Christian tradition, the word adiaphora is often used to refer to matters that are morally indifferent, where believers are entirely free to follow their conscience, as long as it's exercised with a loving sensitivity to those whose conscience takes them in a different direction. You get examples in the New Testament, food sacrificed to idols. 
you're, you're free, says Paul, 1 Corinthians 8, Romans 14, or the matter of circumcision. It's a nothing in and of itself. It doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not. Now, this concept of adiaphora was subsequently extended to refer to things which are neither specifically commanded or forbidden in the Bible. So for the reformers, matters of what you wore in, in church or whether you should observe traditional Christian ceremonies and so on, that these were matters of in, in, indifference. Churches might have to take a line on it, but um, let's not fall out over these things. What about those matters that are addressed in the Bible about which there's disagreement about how to interpret Scripture amongst those who believe in the authority of the Bible? You can think immediately of matters like baptism, church governance, roles of um, men and women, Calvinism, Arminianism, and so on. These matters may not be indifferent. The Bible speaks about them, and we may regard them to be significant and important. We might want to persuade other Christians that they're wrong and point them to another way of understanding the Bible. But nonetheless, we shouldn't elevate them to such an extent that Differences over these, what we might call, secondary matters prevent fellowship with those who are united on the, the core fundamentals of the gospel. These things are not indifferent, and the fact that you have a different view with, with, to me on some of these things might make it hard to plant a church together because a church has to decide on what it's going to do when it comes to baptism or whether it's going to have bishops or not. It might make it hard on some of these things to, to, to train future generations of ministers together. We might have a separate training track. But nonetheless, when the differences are on these so-called secondary things, they're not to stop a genuine sense of belonging. We're on the same side. I love the story of Nelson before Trafalgar. And he heard that two of his admirals had fallen out. And he got them together and joining their hands, he pointed to the French ships in the distance and he said, yonder is the enemy. Oh, you might have differences on some things that you regard as quite significant, but if they're not about the core matters of the gospel and you recognize, recognize that you belong to Christ, then you're not enemies. The Anglican reformers sought to be as inclusive as possible. And it's one of the things I most delight in in my Anglican inheritance, a, a spirit of comprehensiveness as much as possible. J.C. Ryle speaks about the 39 articles and the strong and decided language used when speaking of things that are essential to salvation, about which he said there should be no permitted disagreement. And yet he loved the way in which the 39 articles exhibited what he called studied moderation about things non-essential to salvation and things about which good Christians may differ. We need to learn from history and the terrible ways that uh, Protestants in particular have ended up dividing over all sorts of things. There's a, a, a really sobering essay by John Frame called Machen's Warring Children. Gresham Machen led the, the first uh, split away from the the, the Presbyterian Church in America. And his children, as it were, those who continued in, the, in the Orthodox Presbyterianism, ended up splitting and splitting and splitting. Frame, when he wrote the article, listed 18 different splits since 1930 in Orthodox Presbyterianism. And that can so easily happen. We mustn't insist on uniformity over everything. We might sometimes just agree to differ rather than constantly dividing. And when we do end up perhaps in different denominations and having different points of view which make it hard to work together over everything, if we still recognize there's a unity in the core matters of the gospel, then as Ryle beautifully put it, keep the walls of separation as low as possible and shake hands over them as often as you can. Okay, big question. What about matters of sexual morality and that the big 
division or matter that's causing division with the, within the mainline mixed denominations at the moment over sexuality. Is this a matter that we can say is secondary? We, we should just agree to disagree, as many Anglicans and other denominations are saying, we should just agree to disagree. Now, this is not a matter that the Bible places in the tolerance category. The Bible is clear until the last few years that was accepted down through the ages, and many liberal scholars recognize the Bible is clear, for instance, that homosexual sex is wrong and that sex is for the marriage of a man and a woman. The Bible is clear, and when you look at the scriptures, differences over sexual morality are never regarded as secondary. 1 Corinthians 7 and 8, Paul teaches, don't divide over circumcision, don't divide over food sacrificed to idols, but in the same letter, when Christians in chapter 5 when were accommodating ongoing sexual immorality in their midst, Paul says, chapter 5, you should have disciplined this person. Chapter 6, 9, and 10, sexual immorality is included in a list of behaviors which without repentance lead to people not inheriting the kingdom of God. And within that list, certainly not exclusive to sexual behavior or indeed to homosexual behavior, there's a variety of behaviors, but homosexual behavior is included in that list. So there are limits to toleration. The church at Thyatira is rebuked for tolerating a female prophet who, Revelation 2 verse 20, by her teaching misleads my servants into sexual immorality. Tolerance is not always a virtue. Do you know this little ditty? Sometimes with secret pride I sigh and think how tolerant am I? Then pause and wonder which is mine. Tolerance or a rubber spine. Yes, there's a time for tolerance. And there's another time when we have to say, no, we can't go with that. And so true unity requires upholding the truth, opposing error, embracing tolerance, and finally exuding love. Exuding love. A much quoted line, I think, of Rupert Maldinius, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. It's never a choice between truth and love. Never a balance, a little bit of truth, a little bit of love. Both in full together, like the Lord Jesus, full of grace and truth. The Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year in 2018 was the word toxic. We've seen toxic divisions recently in the American elections. There are toxic divisions in our own politics, closer to home. And sadly, there are toxic divisions even within the church of God, and yes, even within the evangelical church of God. And the way in which debates are engaged in often deeply, deeply dishonoring, I think, to our Lord God, to our shame, we bring dishonor. History, including recent history, tells us that those divisions can be especially bitter when denominations turn towards false teaching. And the divisions are not just between orthodox and liberal, but between the orthodox and the orthodox in sometimes very bitter ways about different responses to liberalism. Francis Schaeffer was a convinced separatist. He actually joined one of the very first splits out of Presbyterianism, one of the first to be ordained in the Bible Presbyterian Church. And yet in midlife, he had a spiritual crisis as he saw the harshness within the separatist movement. He remained a separatist, but he said, there's a danger with those who leave to become too hard and absolutists on even lesser points of doctrine. And they tend, he said, to lose their Christian love for those true Christians who don't come out. Whereas on the other hand, those who stay in, he said, have a tendency towards a growing latitudinarianism. In other words, increasingly going soft. Always saying, oh, well, this would be the line, but the line keeps getting pushed. There are dangers on both sides. And as we debate with one another, if we're not careful, we can be not just debating, but dividing in terrible, toxic ways. We must resist that. So what does love look like 
in this context. Just briefly, three things. First, pray for your opponents. The Lord Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Don Carson has a lovely phrase, never put people down except on your prayer list. It's a great thing instinctively to start by praying. If someone's opposing you, pray. John Newton, after he was converted, was was just a lovely man and a great model, I think, of truth and grace. And he was worried about a younger minister who rather enjoyed conflict and getting involved in controversies, much too much. And Newton wrote him a, a lovely letter. And the first thing he said is, before you put pen to paper, we might say before your fingers send that blog or the tweet, pray for your opponent. And then he said, ask yourself a question. Is he a Christian, that opponent? Well, in a little little while, you'll meet in heaven. And he will then be dearer to you than the nearest friend you have upon earth is to you now. Anticipate that period in your thoughts. And though you may find it necessary to oppose his errors, view him personally as a kindred soul with whom you are happy to be in Christ forever. I mean, do you think he might not be converted? Or are you convinced he's not? Well, then he's a more proper object of your compassion than of your anger, said Newton. Because if God hadn't worked in grace in your life, you'd be just as blind and be saying the same things. So it begins with prayer. Pray for your, pray for your opponents. Next, examine your heart. Look to the plank in your own eye before seeking to remove a speck from a brother's. And even when we're seeking to stand up for God's truth, sin is never far away. And when I'm under attack, and I hate conflict, by the way, but inevitably, if we're leaders of God's church, whether locally or nationally, we're going to come under attack. And I hate it. And I can feel it's so unjust. I can feel I'm badly treated. The emotions go deep. And if I speak from emotion, sin is never far away. Beware of no man more than yourself, said Spurgeon. We carry our worst enemies within us. I've got to be very careful. Is my natural tendency to be combative? Well, just be very, very careful. Look at my heart. Am I speaking from anger at this point? I'll say the wrong thing in the wrong way. If by contrast, my instinct is just to run away from conflict, sometimes I need to be steeled. It's why we need each other, because different individuals will have different instincts, and I need people to to challenge me to stand firm, because I'm tempted to run away from conflict. Others will need to be encouraged. Now, hang on, that's not the time, brother. No, sister, that's not the way to do it. That's not what you should be saying. And while we should be um, engaging, certainly, Uh, with one another. Also, within different tribes, we've got to be careful uh, that we keep meeting each other because different tribes will have their own strengths and weaknesses and we can help each other in that kind of way. Examine your heart. And then finally, mark your words. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Slow to speak. Should I speak at all? Am I the right person? to get involved at this point, in this conflict, in this area of division? If not, keep quiet. Is it, is it really appropriate for me to send that blog? Or am I just fanning the flames to no constructive end? And if I'm persuaded that I should engage, then I need to do so with extreme care. And with God's help and prayer, I preached just a a week ago on 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. Dick Lucas led a mission to students here in Oxford, and at the end of the talk, a, a young man was arrogantly telling him all the ways in which he was wrong, and Dick was tired, and in the heat of the moment, he uh, rather lost his temper. He went home, or at least to where he was staying that night, and leant, uh, knelt by his bedside, and he asked for the Lord's forgiveness. Then he opened his Bible, and coincidentally, or at least in the providence of God, this was the verse that he read. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone. And he wrote in his Bible one word to remind him. Oxford, he put. 
to remind him not to do that again. No, we must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. As the Lord's servant, we should be modelling the Lord Jesus, who was always gentle and lowly. I love that new book by Dane Ortland, Gentle and Lowly. And that was the Lord, even when he engaged in controversy, as he certainly did, always with love and compassion. 2 Timothy 2.25, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That's the hope. We're never just to denounce people, as it were, to get things off our chest. There's always to be hope, a hope that people will change their thinking. And ultimately, of course, we have the great hope in mind because one day the sad divisions of this world will, no be, will, will be no more And one day, the glorious unity which God had in mind for all things under Christ will be realized. And we'll live now in the light of that great vision, praying that God would help us to live in the light of it, that more and more in our churches we'll see pilot projects and in our behavior will be acting not as repellents because of the terrible way in which we live, but as magnets to the God who wants to draw all people and all things together in Christ. Let me pray. Loving Father, forgive us when we ourselves have been divisive, either in what we've said and done or in our hearts. Have mercy upon us. And please help us to follow the Lord Jesus in his wonderful, perfect example of living a life that is full of grace and truth. And we pray for your namesake. Amen. Well, thank you very much for bearing with us over the course of this hour or so. This last number of months has been marked by screen time, and thank you for adding another hour. I hope you found it beneficial. I hope you found it encouraging. I hope you found it challenging. Please do continue to pray and to partner with our trust. We are so thrilled that God has blessed us to this degree, and we know there's much interest in our work, and we know there's much interest and inquiry in relation to support for the trust as well. Just to say that next year, our lecture, God willing, will be in person in November 2021. And the lecture is the Reverend Dr. John Yates III. He is an American scholar. He's an American pastor. He's the rector of a church in Raleigh in North Carolina. And he's part of a a new generation of worldwide leaders. Um, He did a placement himself as a study advisor and assistant to the late canon Dr. John Stott. So he is well placed uh, to speak on the topic that he will be addressing next year. Please look out for what will be happening through our website, through Facebook page, through social media, and through other church news media. So thank you so much for tuning in this evening. Good evening, and God bless.